Good afternoon and welcome to the Center Stage Seminar Series. My name is Tiffany Willoughby, Research Education Programs and Outreach Manager in the Office of Research at the University of Texas at Dallas. I will be your moderator. Joining me today to introduce our guest speaker is Dr. John Hansen, Associate Dean for Research in the Eric Johnson School of Engineering and Computer Science and Professor of Electrical Engineering. Welcome, Dr. Hansen. Thank you very much, Tiffany. Uh, today we have the pleasure of, of hearing uh, one of our leading researchers at the University of Texas at Dallas in the field of uh, analog and mixed signals. Uh, the center stage uh, is focused uh, today on the Texas Analog Center of Excellence, TexACE, located here at the University of Texas at Dallas. It's one of the largest uh, analog research centers uh, in the United States. Uh, TexACE was established in 2008 uh, through a collaboration with the state of Texas, Texas Instruments, and the Semiconductor Research Consortium, and, as well as the University of Texas System, and obviously UT Dallas. Uh, at uh, the helm for Texas is our distinguished uh, speaker today, Dr. Ken O. Ken received his bachelor's, master's, and PhD degrees, all in electrical uh, engineering and computer science from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Uh, from 2000, uh, sorry, from uh, 1989 to 94, uh, he was with uh, Analog Devices a, in, in developing submicron CMOS processes for mixed signal applications in high speed uh, bipolar and uh, bi CMOS processes. He's been a professor at the University of Florida in Gainesville from 1994 till 2009. And he's currently the director of the Texas Analog Center of Excellence, TexAce, as well as the TI Distinguished University Chair Professor of Analog Circuits and Systems here at the, at the University of Texas at Dallas. His research group is developing circuits and components required to implement analog and digital systems operating at frequencies up to 40 terahertz using silicon IC technologies. Uh, Dr. O is also the president of the IEEE Solid State Circuit Society, and he has authored or co-authored uh, in excess of 270 journal and conference papers uh, in the field, as well as holding 13 patents. Dr. O has also received the 2014 Semiconductor Research Consortium uh, Association Research Award, and Professor O is also an IEEE Fellow. We're uh, distinguished. Uh, we're extremely pleased to have Dr. O giving a presentation today on TexAce and the research activities for this center. Take it away, Ken. OK, well, thank you very much, John, for introduction. It is my uh, pleasure to have this opportunity to talk about our center. OK, so let me get started. So uh, as um, John mentioned, uh, I'm the director of um, Texas Analog Center of Excellence, and the mission of the center is to create fundamental analog mixed signal and RF design innovations in integrated circuits and systems that improve energy efficiency, healthcare, and the public safety and security. And our website is listed at the bottom there. And um, so, First, what I'd like to do is um, let me start by talking about what is analog. And um, the information processing devices and networks like uh, computers and internet uh, utilize what they call digital representation of um, signals. And of course, question is, what's digital signals? Well, in digital signals, uh, as you may be able to see here, okay, um, certain, certain digital values, meaning zero to nine, can be assigned to certain range of the uh, signal levels, like over here, uh, like here. These are different levels that where signal uh, levels are assigned while the values are assigned to this certain range of signal levels. And then you have these signal levels in between, right here. You have these uh, in-between levels and they are not utilized. 
of course, in reality, all the levels have um, actual values and can be utilized. And of course, to, to do this, uh, we say we need the analog representation of signals, which is more like here. This right here that represents the analog representation of signals. And um, of course, how about, you know, how do we as a human perceive the world? Is it digital or analog? Well, when we touch, hear, see, taste, and smell, we do not assign levels to certain ranges and ignore in-between levels, like the way the digital representations do. And so the way that we perceive the world is analog, and of course the human beings are analog. And then of course, how about the way that uh, we act upon the world? Well, when we put something, uh, or when we push something, or clap hands, or speak, the levels of signals from these activities are also continuous or analog. And if you look at the definition of the uh, analog in the uh, Merriam-Webster dictionary, it says what's on the slide. Something that is similar or co comparable to something else, either in general or in spe specific details. And of course, for us, we are analog signal that we are using here. This something is actually the electrical signals. Okay, so electrical signal is that something similar that is actually to the real world signals. And so the analog word analog comes from the fact that el electrical signals that we are using to represent the real world signal is actually analog to the real world signals. And of course, in order to make the digital world work with the real world, that's analog, uh, we have to condition the real world signals and convert them to into digital representations. And in order for us to use the digital information to act on the real world, we must convert the digital information to analog representations. And of course, because of this, we at Texas, in addition to working with analog signals and applications, we also work with analog signal right here, and also digital signals over here to bridge the real world with the digital information world. And of course, this is the reason why we have this X that has both the digital and also analog signals in our logo. And clearly, uh, these analog circuits or analog and digital mixing mix, uh, signal circuits and systems are used everywhere, and they are an integral part of the integrated circuits technology that is right now saving the civilization uh, during this pandemic. So Texas is actually a center of semiconductor research corporation, uh, or SRC. It's a consortium of semiconductor companies uh, which have been uh, created to support academic research in the semiconductor field. And um, so Texas is supported by SRC, but it's also supported by Texas Instruments and also UT System through UTD. And um, the center, I'm happy to report that has been renewed for another three years of operation. And um, so we are actually in the first year of this new three-year cycle. And uh, the total commitment of the funding for the center for the next three years is uh, 15.6 million. And um, aggregated funding for the center uh, for the past 12 years is around 54 million. And if you actually include the non-SRC uh, sources, then it actually goes up to about $73 million. Uh, 
So this is a big operation. And um, of course, in 2018, we celebrated our 10th anniversary. And it was a great chance to look back what the center has done. And um, during two, from 2008 to 2018, the center supported 203 research tasks led by 121 principal investigators at 44 different universities. And universities actually not just in US, but all over the world. And we graduated 184 PhDs between 2010 and 2017. And um, we actually had a ceremony to uh, acknowledge the founders of the the center and of course Rich Templeton of the uh, TI was one of the uh, founders of the center. And um, during this celebration, one of the things that we did was we actually uh, defined the goal for the center for the next decade or well, the second decade. And the goal for us for this uh, new decade is to foresee failures before they occur using secure intelligence sensors in order to prevent or to mitigate their impact. It sounds a little technical, but what we are really trying to say is we like to be able to see the future. In particular, we like to predict the time when something will fail or time to failure for something, okay? And if you think about the applications of this technique, our technology, it's really far reaching. You know, for instance, uh, getting sick is an example of a failure. And if you can predict when, you, when you're gonna get sick, that's going to be really useful, right? And if you can predict that you are about to, or, you know, if you don't be careful, you may get into an accident, that will be an amazing, uh, amazing technology. And of course you can utilize this in manufacturing lines. You wanna make sure that the lines are operating all the time, but if something's about to fail, then you like to know so that you can get in there, fix things before it actually has catastrophic failures. And for instance, at home, you know, in Texas, of course, big thing is air conditioners. And you know you don't like to be surprised by air conditioning uh, failures in the middle of summer. If you can figure out that it's going to fail, um, you know, a week before, then you can do something about it. You know, same thing with the traffic signs, and of course, you know, there are things like bridges collapsing. And if you can predict these things in the future it can be really helpful. And of course, you know, we just went through this horrible uh, winter storm. And once again there, you know, if we can somehow see, foresee the failures before they actually happen, we could have done things to mitigate their impact. And of course, to do this, you need key technologies. And the key technologies are the advanced sensors, and energy efficient artificial intelligence and hardware security for these ICs because you know these sensors are going to generate a lot of data and um, this data needs to be protected. And so hardware security is going to be a key part of actually protecting this data that it generates. And um, of course you need to move this data around and um, so you will need really high data rate, energy efficient communication technologies. And of course, if we can actually do this, then we'll be able to be true to our mission of um, improving energy efficiency, healthcare and public safety and security. So last year, uh, Texas supported 74 research tasks led by 61 PIs at 31 universities. And um, as John mentioned, this is the largest university-based analog center in the world. And uh, we are leading the analog research in US and the world. And um, the center is uh, organized around the, you know, the key societal problems that we are trying to address. 
And uh, one is, of course, the safety, security, and healthcare. And that thrust is led by Professor Yorgos Makras of um, UT Dallas. And the energy efficiency thrust is led by Professor Ali Nikonjad of um, UC Berkeley. And the, of course, they are, you know, the technologies and the research which are cross-cutting these two areas. Uh, so we have a third thrust called fundamental analog circuits research, and that's led by Professor Pavan Hanumulu on, of the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign. And um, when you have a center like this, one of the key things is to increase the interactions among researchers so that we can better focus research tasks and also better leverage the diverse capabilities of the PIs. And um, at the end, what you need to do is you have to ensure that the outputs of this center like this is much greater than the sum of the individual parts. And also when you have this kind of big activities, you can actually do things to really affect the uh, research infrastructure for not just UTD, but for the entire country and entire community. And so what I'd like to do is let me just um, start by giving uh, an overview of um, the kind of the organization of the research. So the main research focus of our center is about integrated circuits and the system design. And um, integrated circuits and system design requires much more than just design for functionality. It involves how to actually package the ICs, how to test the uh, ICs. Um, you know, if you think about uh, the number of ICs that's being uh, fabricated, test is a daunting uh, challenge for the uh, IC design. And of course, the other is how to guarantee reliability and also how to make it secure the way that I talked about. And of course, also how to manage the heat that uh, the ICs actually generate. And of course, that relates to the packaging and also how to efficiently simulate and verify the circuits that you are actually uh, building, as well as other enabling technologies. And um, as I mentioned before, the mission for the center is to improve energy efficiency, healthcare, and public safety and uh, security, and um, to make sure the research in integrated circuit design is um, driven by the submission. We have these application drivers that's out here, right? So we have these application drivers and um, a key requirement for these application drivers is uh, that in addition to addressing big societal needs uh, that we talked about, they must also provide unique integrated circuit design challenges uh, that are suitable for research in academic settings. So, this center is really all about integrated circuits. And um, so it's a focus on integrated circuits, but then there are other things that actually come to make sure the integrated circuits work properly and they are useful. And also the way that we drive the research using applications area is not about the applications area. Of course, that's part of it, but really the key deciding point is whether these application drivers will pose new integrated circuit design challenges that require research in academic settings. So, of course, TechSace is committed to alleviate the global energy problem by improving energy efficiency of electronic systems, as well as developing analog technologies that can make energy generation, distribution, and utilization more efficient. Uh, the circuit, you know, the center is also working to energize and power long lasting tiny devices that's measured in millimeters, like um, for instance, right here. This will be an example of the thing that we do that. 
Other things that we work on are um, power converters in terms of energy efficiency. The power converters are you know, the circuits that converts the, the DC voltage levels from one level to another. Like for instance, in a car, you might have a battery that's running at 24 volt, but you know, a lot of circuits actually need voltages down at one volt. So somebody needs to actually convert these um, voltage levels from high voltage to low voltage that's actually used by integrated circuits. So that would be, that would be an example of a power converter. Or it could be at home, you, you need to convert the uh, AC voltage that's coming in from your plug into DC voltages. Or sometimes you, you have um, energies that's stored in batteries that's DC, and then you need to convert that into AC. So that would be another example of power converters. And then, of course, um, the other thing that is really important is to, to improve the energy efficiency. You need to actually co-optimize the converters and the voltage regulators that you have in the systems with the systems themselves. So that's another one that we do. And we're working to actually develop communication links with the power consumption that scale uh, with data rate. Of course, the heat removal uh, is a big problem. And so if you, uh, and then also uh, these circuits that generate less electromagnetic interference. And when you have um, power circuits, they're dealing with a lot of power. And then, you know, if it's not designed properly, they can actually generate a lot of um, sort of um, spurious signals. And these signals can interfere with um, operation of uh, other electronics and that can lead into real problems. So uh, one of the key things that we're working on is to actually how to reduce these interference effects. And of course, we are looking at low power analog to digital converters and the energy storage and delivery systems using carbon nanotubes to actually uh, reduce the size of these um, power systems. And um, also, uh, we've been working on fast startup crystal oscillator with um, reduced power consumption. Well, crystal oscillator is basically a clock. Okay, it's a timing device. And of course, you know, that sounds like something, you know, very a niche area, but if you can actually reduce the power consumption of that, it can have amazing impact in the entire electronics industry because, you know, these days, uh, any electronic systems will have uh, multiple uh, clocks. And now there are billions of these electronic systems being uh, built each year, and of course, you know, having this reduced power consumption can have tremendous impact, especially the uh, mobile devices. And um, of course, the other thing that's really important for us is also doing built-in self-test of um, these power management integrated circuits. What does it mean to uh, to built-in self-test? As I said, one of the key areas the center is working on is uh, testing. And, uh, you know, so each year, the IC industry produces more than 300 billion integrated circuits. And so testing those 300 billion integrated circuits before shipping is a huge, huge problem. And of course, if you can make the ICs to be smart enough so that it can test and it can tell you whether the circuit is IC is good or bad, then that can really simplify the, uh, the testing and reduce the cost of these circuits. And so this is a really an important area of research for us. And um, of course, the other thing is that many of the solutions that uh, we are employing uh, in our uh, research is the, uh, that exploits the digital I see technology trends because at the end, you know, whatever we do, we have to utilize the things that's being developed by the uh, IC technology industry. And um, so we are actually applying uh, novel uh, architectures. They are that are compatible to the uh, digital IC technology trends uh, in order to improve the control 
and also expand the flexibility of the uh, overall system. And um, of course, uh, the public safety and security and healthcare uh, thrust is uh, working to improve the safety by mitigating uh, various reliability threats in analog and wireless devices, including uh, electrostatic discharge. Well, the electrostatic discharge, of course, everybody has experienced that, right? When it's dry, you can have, you can just get zapped by, a, uh, zapped by the uh, electrostatic uh, discharge. And of course, if you do that to an integrated circuit, you can basically, uh, damage the uh, integrated circuits. And so protecting integrated circuits from electrostatic discharge, especially these uh, devices built using uh, advanced IC technology uh, is very uh, important problem and the challenge. And also uh, noise in the power supply. Uh, sometimes what happens is if you have noise in the power supply, the voltage level in your power supply can vary. And then if it, it is no, if the noise is too high, it can also damage the integrated circuits. And of course the temperature also can cause the stress. Uh, and also the other one is electromigration. Uh, the electromigration is basically when you put current through wires, it can, if you do that for a long time, it can basically weaken the uh, wires. And of course, if you put too much current, you can actually blow up the wires, right? And of course, you know, that's how the fuses work at home, right? Where if the too much current is flowing through the fuse, it just pops, right? So, um, and of course, this can happen in a varying level in integrated circuits, and it can actually pose reliability problems for the uh, integrated circuits. And so we are really interested in understanding and modeling these kind of phenomena. And um, we're also uh, developing machine learning based AI or AI design and verification and test solutions. And of course, that's really an important part to making sure that you do test the parts properly. And um, the other thing that this thrust is doing is actually seeking to reduce the cost of a millimeter wave imaging and on vehicular beta technology for automotive safety uh, by researching signal processing techniques that reduce system complexity and also transmitter architecture that can efficiently adapt to changing uh, environments, uh, as well as sensor fusion techniques that can enable monitoring of the behaviors of drivers in uh, automobile. And that the millimeter wave frequency is the frequency range between 30 gigahertz to 300 gigahertz. And uh, we are also uh, investigating use of this, uh, the radar technology for vital sign detection. That is, we like to be actually, you can, uh, when you look at the, uh, use the radar, you can actually tell if, if there is a heartbeat there or if there's something breathing that, uh, you know, from the signals that you get from these uh, radar. And um, of course, uh, this thrust is also investigating methods to protect uh, integrated circuits from security breaches that I have uh, mentioned before. And uh, going to the uh, fundamental analog uh, circuits uh, thrust, and of course this Thrust focuses on uh, cross-cutting areas in analog and mixed signal uh, circuits, which impact all of the uh, Texas application areas. And uh, the list of research includes design of um, a wide variety of um, analog to zero converters, communication links, noise reduction techniques, uh, new amplifier topologies, suitable for use in advanced IC technologies and uh, development of CAD tools and testing of integrated circuits. And once again, testing is a uh, real, one of the key challenges for the center. And um, so now let me just um, talk a little bit about some of the things that 
uh, the center is doing to actually improve the research infrastructure for the country and for the researchers. And um, one of the things that we have is something called Texas IC Fabrication Program, where it's the program to basically reduce the cost of the fabrication of integrated circuits that researchers are developing. And uh, the problem is that fabrication in nanoscale CMOS technologies is costly and it's not routinely available and it limits the avail ability to perform leading edge circuits research. And so uh, with the help of uh, SRC and uh, with the fund from the center, we are uh, providing fabrication at almost one third uh, of normal price. And sometimes we are actually providing free fabrication services for our uh, researchers. And of course, the other is we have one of the best electronic circuits characterization laboratory uh, in the US. And we have a um, shared facility uh, for characterization of circuits that's operating all the way up to what we call some millimeter wave frequencies, which is up to three terahertz. And um, we have ways to actually measure antennas up to 300 gigahertz and just a lot more uh, and very unique capabilities that very few institutions actually have in US and in world. And of course, this research facility is open to outside users and uh, Texas members have um, priority to use this uh, facility. And now what I'd like to do is just talk briefly about the impact that Texas uh, has made. And of course, the biggest impact is educating students. It's an academic uh, research center. And so our biggest impact are our, uh, is the students. And um, so last year, uh, we have uh, graduated 23 PhD students and uh, five ma uh, masters and one bachelor students. And so the total uh, right now is up to 221 PhD students since the uh, creation of the uh, center. And of course, uh, the other thing is, you know, the university professors, we count uh, publications. And um, so uh, last year we published uh, 29 journal papers and the 48 conference papers. And uh, we have, I think total is um, now up to uh, 700 and close to 800 for the conference papers and about 260 uh, journal papers. And uh, we have, of course, numerous patents and then we have licensed these technologies to uh, numerous companies. And of course, the other Texas impact is that, you know, the research projects that we have actually are leading to other uh, research projects, actually even sometimes a lot of times much bigger efforts than the, uh, the research efforts that we have supported. And um, so this is just some of the projects that have evolved out of Texas. And this is not a complete list, but uh, so this is something that I've done a couple of years ago and we're up to about 12 million that we knew about. And of course, the other thing is that, you know, the technology that uh, we have developed has actually become the key technology that enabled the creation of this jump comm center that's led by uh, Ali Nikonjad of UC Berkeley. And of course, that effort is about $30 million effort. Uh, and so uh, we are making a huge impact in terms of actually uh, creating uh, new research programs and spinning off our research to do this. And of course, the other is that, you know, the technology that technologies that we have created are being utilized by our members and others in the industry. And so, for instance, a lot of the work that we have done in integrated power electronics are being found, you know, being utilized in the products of a member companies and others. And the low cost ADD converter testing technology is also being utilized by the member companies and clock generation technology. 
uh, is also being utilized. And the, you know, the millimeter CMOS radar, uh, this work, of course, has been done by the center. And now uh, you are going to be seeing uh, these chips that actually started from you know, our research in many cars, I believe, starting uh, next year. And so this is going to become one of the you know, main new technologies that's going to have us spun out of our center. And of course, the other one is um, Insilixa, which is actually doing lap on chip. And um, you know, they are actually building these uh, scalable uh, test platforms for uh, actually testing for virus that's much quicker and more accurate. And um, so, uh, you know, this is the work uh, that's spun out of Texas and actually they licensed uh, numerous patents in order to start this company. And um, another company called Movellus, this was actually spun out of um, University of Michigan. They are actually uh, trying to automate the design of um, mixed signal or analog and digital mixed signal circuits. And this is starting to become a really, you know, they're really serving an important segment of the industry in that, you know, designing uh, mixed signal circuits in uh, advanced technology nodes are becoming very challenging. And by doing this automating, they can uh, solve that problem or help to alleviate the problem. And of course, you know, Professor Yun Chu of UTD started a company called Formula Microelectronics uh, that was uh, started in Shanghai. So Texas research is making tremendous impact uh, to the uh, industry and of course through the industry uh, to the society at large. And now what I would like to do is I would like to finish off by just briefly talking about uh, the new initiative that Office of Research has started in collaboration with Texas, which we call Texas Collaboration Initiative or TCI. And the, this is an internal funding mechanism that's designed to stimulate interdisciplinary research collaborations with a high likelihood of securing major externally funded research. And um, so the type of research that we are looking for uh, is really the research that fits within the framework of the Texas research that I have talked about earlier. And um, this grant program is actually open to uh, faculty members who are not currently affiliated with the Texas. And so uh, what that means is that if you did not have any affiliation with Texas in the previous five years, then you will be considered as a non-Texas affiliated faculty members. But one key feature is that uh, you have to actually find one co-PI who is currently affiliated with Texas. So uh, we believe that this will make the uh, integration of the projects into Texas environment uh, much more efficient. And so we have that requirement, but you know, the, what we expect is that most of the funding should be going to the PI, not to the co-PI. And um, so one of the things that you should consider when you actually put together this uh, TCI grant is that the timeline for submitting the uh, grant application should be about 12 to 18 months ahead of team's anticipated submission to one or more target external uh, grant programs. So in addition to being you know, within the framework of um, Texas uh, research, but I really the key thing is really the potential for uh, getting external funding that you can use and you can use the, uh, this grant to actually get external grant. So that will be the really the key thing that should be uh, everybody should focus. And the allowed budget is uh, $40,000. And um, the, uh, the co-PI is allowed to get maximum of 5,000 only. So most of the funding uh, should be given to the PI that's 
who is not affiliated with the Texas at this point. And the submission deadline is March 31st, 2021. And um, you can uh, find out this information by the link over here. And I think the link is now available on the, uh, the chat box. So you should be able to get that from there. And so I have the last slide. Uh, you know, it's, I'm sorry, it's the second to the last slide. And of course, this lists the uh, current Texas principal and co-principal investigators. And uh, the people who are highlighted the orange, they are the uh, UTD Texas faculty members. And um, you can actually find this information on page nine of our annual report right here. And then also there is a link for that. And as I said, that information can be found in page nine of that link. And I think you should have this uh, link in your chat box as well. And this is really an exciting opportunity uh, for Texas. And I think also the faculty members at uh, UTD in that this provides opportunities for us to actually expand our research portfolio and also course, engage the uh, broader uh, research community in uh, at UTD. And so I'm really looking forward to finding new collaborators through this program. And um, so that concludes my presentation and I will be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Dr. O. There are a few questions in the queue. The first okay. one is, how is analog data better than digital technology? It's actually, there are several aspects of it. Uh, one is that, uh, let me just get this back to, well, one thing is that actually they are not the same, right? They are actually different in that, you know, if you look at analog signal that we are talking about, uh, they are actually, you know, real world signals, while the digital signals is an actually an abstraction of the uh, real signal that you are actually processing. Okay, so there is that difference. But now in terms of, um, but then there are works that's going on at this point where people are utilize, actually utilizing the, comp trying to do computation using analog circuits. And as a matter of fact, you know, it turns out this is a really an old idea uh, where long time ago, actually the, the more practical computers for many years were the actually analog computers, not the digital computers. So this is like in uh, 40s, in 1940s. So there was actually a big industry around analog computers where it would solve um, differential equations and do actually math problems. And, um, but of course, eventually the digital computers took over as, uh, you know, the performance of these digital computers became uh, better. And also fundamentally, it's more robust compared to analog computing. And um, so it took over, but the reason why the analog computing is still uh, important is if you look at the energy efficiency, the energy efficiency of analog computing is far superior than digital computing. And as a matter of fact, there are many people who think that analog computing, like our, you know, the way humans compute, will be the, uh, the key to really uh, make uh, machine learning uh, practical in like a, uh, you know, handheld devices that we have that has um, limited power. Thank you, Dr. O. Oh. Now, is human voice analog or digital? At least the way, well, it is analog, right? Because, you know, uh, when you see the actual uh, voice signal, they come, they don't come in discrete steps, right? They actually come in from low to high in a continuous man manner in the amplitude, also in the frequency. The frequency changes gradually from, you know, over that entire uh, the 
frequency range for the audio signals. So it's analog. Now, having said that, is analog sound better than digital? <laughs> and can you justify why or why not? Well, I think that's, you know, so that there is a whole group of people, right, who feel, you know, for instance, using a special copper wires from Australia, it actually sounds better than anything else. Okay. And um, so I, th I think the sounding better is actually very much of um, personal preference and how great your uh, ears and your brain are. Uh, you know, it's, there are certain limitations, right? Some people still prefer um, recording from, you know, the uh, LPs, right? Not even CDs, but LPs, right? And um, so I, I think that's actually much on the uh, the preference. Uh, but one thing I can say is that if you do the, uh, the digital sound, what you are going to get is much more consistent uh, playback than you know analog because there are more things that can actually mix into the process of creating the sound. And um, so, but as I said, some people think that's what actually makes um, the audio sound better. So I think it can go both ways. Very good. Now, still tracking along the same conversation, can you convert analog to digital and vice versa? Of course, that's what you, you have to do, right? Because the, the real world signal, right, is analog. And But the thing is that if you wanted to somehow get that information, that analog uh, information, so that it can be used by your computers, we need to convert that into digital domain. And so analog to digital conversion is one of the big areas of the research. And, you know, I think we have many programs and projects around building LED converters. And also same thing goes on the other side, right? Because you can do all this information processing and, you know, you can get signal, you can get the actual, you know, the bits uh, from internet, but now eventually you need to display that on your computer while well, you need to convert that into, um, a, you know, sound. And then, so what you need is now, eventually you need at the end, digital to analog converters that would actually convert the digital signals to into analog signals that will be uh, pleasing to us. Absolutely. And then these are really important areas of research. It's, it's, a, it's a fundamental building block for any electronic systems these days. Now, Dr. O, can you tell me if analog design is difficult? And if so, why? Well, you know, really, if you look at the analog design, um, you know, there fundamentally, you are limited by the uh, non-idealities of the real world. Okay, and um, so uh, what's the non-idealities that you are dealing with? It's the noise, okay? Because as I mentioned before, the, in analog circuit design, uh, the signal is continuous, okay? And so one of the problems with um, analog signals is that any disturbance in this, uh, the signal that's continuous by things like what we call noise, right? Or any kind of disturbance, then that can actually affect the quality of the signal that you have or quality of the actually the sound that you get uh, if it's an audio case. And um, so what you have to do is you're, you're really fighting the noise on one side. And of course, um, in the upper side, if you make signals too big, then you can also have a problems, right? Um, you know, this happens when you crank up your stereo and then, you know, suddenly you end up getting this distortion. And so that's the other problem the analog circuits have. But, you know, one of the things that's nice thing about the digital is actually because you have these, uh, the gaps between different levels, OK, 
Okay. And so if, if your disturbance is small, then it will not affect the, actually the, uh, the compute, computed values of the digital circuits. And of course, that's what makes the digital circuits uh, more robust than analog circuits and also make it simpler to design because it's much more tolerant than analog circuits. So it's really the, you know, it really comes from the fact that you are dealing with the continuous signal. Okay, and you talked briefly about um, how analog signals are prone to maybe some loss or interference. Um, we have an audience member who asked what strategies or technologies could help combat this disadvantage? So, you know, one of the simplest things that people used to do, and of course they don't do that anymore. Uh, well, I, I should say they still do it because if you open up like an iPhone or many electronic systems, what they do is actually they literally put metal cages around, um, you know, integrated circuits that need to be protected. And um, so one of the things that we are doing uh, and is actually the strategy of what they call um, one of the problems that happens is that you know when you are building these power converters, you end up having these signals that's synchronizing the uh, convergent process. And um, so one of the side effects of the synchronizing the uh, convergent process using essentially like a clock, okay? And then what happens is because everything um, actually switches at a known time or periods, okay? It can actually generate noise at particular frequencies. And um, so one of the ways you can mitigate that is actually you vary the frequency of this clock uh, in a random way. And then what that does is that instead of, you know, getting one huge spike, it actually what we call spreads out the signal, the noise or the interference signals over uh, wider frequency range. And so the amplitude actually goes down. And um, so that's one of the things that uh, our center is working to mitigate the uh, EMI effect, or, you know, the uh, electromagnetic interference effects. Thank you, Dr. O. Oh, at this time, there are no additional questions in the queue. Thank you for sharing your time, talent, and resources with the attendees and community at large, Dr. O. Oh. For additional information, and a comprehensive list of Office of Research events, please visit research.utdallas.edu. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. And um, I'm looking forward to uh, receiving many proposals through the TCI program.